Our guest today is Jay Siegert, who is an author and international speaker, and he holds degrees in both physics and engineering technology. He currently serves as the managing director of the Starting Point Project, which defends the Christian worldview, and he is also the vice president of Logos Research Associates. Jay has been speaking on the authority of scripture for over 38 years. Jay, welcome to Hope Today. It's great to be on the program. Well, let me ask you about the authority of scripture. That's a good place to start because you teach in the area of creation science. What is the importance of the first two chapters of Genesis? I mean, we believe the Bible. Why do we need to believe those first two chapters? God chose to have that at the beginning of the Bible. It's a foundation. Pretty much every major doctrine we believe as Christians is founded in the book of Genesis. If there are errors in Genesis, problems, contradictions, it didn't really happen that way, we, we do lose our foundation for pretty much everything that we believe. So it's very important that we trust God for what he says versus going to some other source of authority and assuming that that's true and using that as a filter to decide what we're gonna believe in the Bible and what we're not. And you know, it's interesting because a, a few decades ago, it would have been like, oh, there's, uh, there's atheists and non-Christians doing that. Now Christians more than ever seem to want to dismiss the literal nature of those chapters. It's, I think it has to do with like John chapter 12 where it says many other leaders believed in Jesus, but for fear of the Pharisees kicking them out of the synagogue, they didn't want to confess him. And that's what I've seen today in the years that I've been traveling around is there are a lot of Christians who they're afraid to just take the Bible for what it says because they're going to lose the respect of the academic you know, community around them, friends, peers, other people at church. And so they have their own version of the Bible, what they're going to believe and what they're not, which sets themselves up as the ultimate authority. Well, let me ask you about talking to people who don't share a similar worldview as we would share. How do you speak to someone? In fact, Let's go right for the, how do you talk to an atheist? Uh, we've seen a rise in atheism. I think there's probably a vacuum that they've rushed, that the atheists have rushed into that. What do you say to a person who's not gonna accept that, the, 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 the truth of the gospel? Sure. My approach, and it's an approach that anyone can use, is rather than being too quick to jump in and try to prove everything we believe, simply listen to what they're saying and ask follow-up questions to get clarification, what led them to those beliefs, why are they confident those things are true, and stick to the big picture. Meaning, when you're talking to an atheist, first hear what they actually believe. Don't assume you know what their beliefs are. Let them answer the big uh, questions. Like, where did stuff come from? <laughs> Matter and energy, there's an entire universe here. So how did the stuff get here? How did the stuff form an orderly universe and solar system with planets and stars and galaxies? How did non-living chemicals come together to form a living cell that could reproduce itself? How did that cell, when it was copying itself over and over and over, switch to making a pink and a blue one, a male and a female, that would each now only share half of the genetic information to keep going? Mm -hmm. And then how do we get the great variety of life, meaning if you have a single cell and it's gonna turn into every other life form on this planet, including us, you have to add a lot of information, tons of information along the way. Where does that information come from? And then how do these particles that were banging together in the Big Bang, how do they eventually become aware of themselves and start having opinions about other collections of particles consciousness? Uh, how do you address those things as an atheist and let them answer before you even start to talk about your own foundation of so, God's so, existence? So you give them an opportunity to kind of share where they're at before you just sort of like try to zing them with something. Right, and then it sets you in a position to ask even deeper questions and what happens is they will realize they're making a lot of bold claims with virtually nothing to back it up. And then it puts you in a good position to say, hey, I really appreciate you sharing that. It helps you better understand what it is you believe and, and why. Now, I'll share with you the conclusions I've come to. I, I believe that there is a God because how do you get something out of nothing? And also you could look at nature all life long and you can come to the conclusion these things are incredibly designed. When you look at DNA, which I give lectures on, there's no way that's an accident, but you can look at that your entire life and it would never tell you who created it, why they created it, or what happens to us when we die. The only way you could have those questions answered is if that creator left you a note. And that's what the Bible claims to be. It claims to be a note from the creator saying, I'm the one who did this. This is why I did it. This is what happened to it. Here's my plan to fix it. And here's what happens to you when you die. Well, what's great about that is it moves beyond the intellectual argument into the matters of the heart and matters of, of, uh, of, of 
of salvation and things like that. It really begins to have a, a new open door that wasn't there before. This is uh, related to another approach that I use. A lot of other Christians, very well intended, throw a lot of facts out there, but facts have to be interpreted. The atheist will just interpret them differently. What I like to do is go to Romans chapter one with the atheist and tell them that the Bible says that God has given so much evidence for his existence just in nature that mankind is without excuse. No one's ever gonna stand before him and say, I would have believed in you, but you didn't give me enough evidence. God's saying, oh no, I gave enough evidence. And God has actually put the knowledge of himself, his existence, inside every human being. So I, as a Christian, have to believe you know God exists. That's what they'll get a little upset. I don't believe that God exists. I get that. Uh, Romans goes on to say that even though God has given all this evidence, some people have chosen to reject the evidence. And God mm -hmm. says, okay, I'm not going to force you to believe in me, but if you do reject it, there are consequences. And then the rest of Romans chapter 1 goes on to describe these consequences. So when I take them through that, then I say, I can tell you all about the DNA stuff that's really cool, but I don't believe that that's going to change your mind. We're dealing with a spiritual issue. So knowing that, how would you like to proceed? <laughs> yeah, that, that's a, that is a great lead in. You know, uh, it's, it's interesting. Um, uh, God calls us to, to touch lives, calls us to preach the gospel, calls us to share his love. And, and society just tries more and more to put up barriers to that, it seems. Where has society, we could talk about this for hours, but where, in your view, has society left the foundations that are so important to us having a society that functions properly? Sure, it certainly didn't happen overnight. Uh, there's a lot of details behind that history starting even prior to Darwin. A lot of people come down pretty hard on Darwin. They say, oh, he invented the idea of evolution and changed everything. No, he didn't invent it. He just popularized it. Mm -hmm. Prior to him, a few other scientists, um, James Hutton, Charles Lyell said, when you look at the earth, we can only resort to natural explanations mm -hmm. over long periods of time to explain the mountains and the canyons and all that rather than looking at what scripture has to say. And Charles Lyell said that we need to get away from the writings of Moses when we're explaining things. Well, what did Moses write? We wrote Genesis, including creation, the flood. Right. So they purposely wanted to get away from the acts of God to explain things and say, no, it's just natural processes. Then Darwin said, if these guys could explain the physical features of the earth by natural processes over these newly found millions of years, maybe he, Darwin, could explain the variety of life by natural processes and these newly found millions of years, and he writes the origin of species. And then the church started compromising a little bit with that and saying, well, maybe Genesis doesn't mean what it says. We've looked at it wrong. So they came up with different ways of interpreting mm -hmm. it differently, like day-age theory and gap theory. And that was just kind of a slowly degradation of man's and Christian's view of God's word, where they became the ultimate authority, picking and choosing what they're willing to believe. Right. You know. Um it's when you uh, have approached someone who has a different opinion scientifically than you, have you been able, have you seen, like we were just talking about a moment ago where you share, let them share, then you share, have you seen it be effective to touch someone's life? Definitely. Most of the time it's a process because they didn't get where they are overnight. Right. And I've even told atheists, if you change your mind during lunch today, I won't have a lot of respect for you because <laughs> I'm not expecting that, but I just want to put a pebble in their <laughs> shoe, something for them to think about that they have to kind of walk away with. But you know, we had, I lead Grand Canyon tours. And yeah, tell us about the Grand, I'm, I'm fascinated. I, I saw the Grand Canyon a couple of years ago. Well, I guess it's four years ago now, but I saw it for the first time in my life. Very impressive. Why do you do Grand Canyon tours? All about the authority of scripture. Uh, Genesis talks about the creation account, which is controversial in even many Christians' minds. But then Genesis six through eight says there was a worldwide flood. A lot of Christians say, yeah, I know the Bible talks about a flood, but I'm not sure what to think about it. Is that really possible? And I'm kind of embarrassed to talk about it. So they want to fast forward and get to Jesus. What we do is we take people on tours of the Grand Canyon. It's the best spot on the entire planet to see evidence there really was a worldwide flood. We spend one day walking along the rim, flat paved path, it's an easy tour, and then looking one mile down to the Colorado River, and we point out all these scientific reasons why these layers must have been laid down catastrophically, and it must have been carved out catastrophically. The next day, we're actually on the river. We take a bus through a two-mile tunnel, come out at the Glen Canyon Dam, get in rafts, and we float smoothly, go around the famous Horseshoe Bend, mm -hmm. 
talking more about evidences, there was a worldwide flood, always pointing it back to the authority of scripture. Oh, there's a science class anybody would be glad to yeah. sign up for, right? <laughs> just, just before we go, do you have any latest projects? What's, what's going on in your, uh, in your ministry? I just finished my third book. I've got 24 videos. I've got 22 existing videos. I'm making 24 more half hour videos. Also gonna be putting together an entire apologetics training video series to train others to be able to better defend their faith. And if they wanna get into apologetics full time, they would be a good resource for them. I love what you say about apologetics. It's not about, it's not about winning an argument, is right. it? It's about somebody's life and Christ, somebody coming to Christ. Well, Jay Seeger, thank you so much for being with us today. I appreciate everything that you're sharing and everything that you're doing. And we're gonna be seeing you on Origins throughout the, uh, the summer and the, and the fall. And uh, we're so glad that you came. Appreciate the opportunity to be on the program.